Hi guys, welcome back for another read aloud. Well, we finished Crenshaw, so I'm going to start um, another book. It's called Out of the Dust, and it's historical fiction. It takes place back in the 1930s. Um, but I want to share my screen with you because this book talks about something called a dust bowl. And I just wanted to share this Wikipedia page with you so that um, we all had a little understanding of what the Dust Bowl is, or was rather. So it says, the Dust Bowl was a period of severe dust storms that greatly damaged the ecology and agriculture of the American and Canadian prairies during the 1930s. There was a severe drought and a failure to apply dry land farming methods to prevent this wind erosion that caused the phenomenon. The drought came in three waves, 1934, 1936, and then from 1939 to 1940. But some regions of the High Plains experienced drought conditions for as many as eight years. So now that you kind of have an understanding about what the Dust Bowl is, um, that will help you understand um, this book and the difficulties that um, that come up. Um, this book is written in an interesting way just because it's broken into sections by season um, and it's sort of told in a in a poetic way. It's not told like in necessarily complete sentences that flow like paragraph to paragraph. So it's a pretty fun and easy read. Um, even though the story is kind of depressing at times. So we start in winter 1934, although the beginning is August 1920 in the beginning. As summer wheat came right, so did I, born at home on the kitchen floor. Ma crouched barefoot, bare bottomed over the swept boards because that's where daddy said it'd be best. I came too fast for the doctor, bawling as soon as Daddy wiped his hands around inside my mouth. To hear Ma tell it, I hollered myself red the day that I was born. Red's the color I've stayed ever since. <clears throat> Daddy named me Billy Joe. He wanted a boy. Instead, he got a long-legged girl with a wide mouth and cheekbones like bicycle handles. He got a red-headed, freckled-faced, narrow-hipped girl with a fondness for apples and a hunger for playing fierce piano. <clears throat> From the earliest I can remember, I've been restless in this little panhandle shack we call home, always getting in Ma's way with my pointy elbows and my fidgety legs. By the summer I turned nine, Daddy had given up about having a boy. He tried making me do. I look just like him. I can handle myself most everywhere he puts me, even on the tractor, though I don't like that much. Ma tried having other babies, but it never seemed to go right except with me. But this morning, Ma let on how she's expecting again. Other than the three of us, there's not much family to speak of. Daddy, the only boy Kelby left since Grandpa died from a cancer that ate up most of his skin, and Aunt Ellis, almost 14 years older than Daddy, and living in Lubbock, Lubbock a ways south of here, and a whole world apart, to hear Daddy tell it. And Ma, with only great uncle Floyd, old as ancient bones and mean as a rattler, rotting away in that room down in Dallas. I'll be nearly 14, just like Aunt Ellis was when Daddy was born by the time this baby comes. I wonder if Daddy will get his boy this time. So that was January 1934. This one's called Rabbit Battles. Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney have a bet going as to who can kill the most rabbits. It all started at the rabbit drive last Monday over in Sturgis when Mr. Noble got himself worked up about the damage done to his crop by jacks. Mr. Romney swore he'd had more rabbit trouble than anyone than anyone in Cimarron County. They pledged revenge on the rabbit population, wagering who could kill more. They ought to just shut up, betting on how many rabbits they can kill? Honestly, grown men clubbing bunnies to death makes me sick to my stomach. I know rabbits eat what they shouldn't, especially this time of year, when they could hop halfway to liberal and still not find food. 
but Miss Freeland says if we keep plowing under the stuff they ought to be eating, what are they supposed to do? Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney came home from Sturgis Money Monday with 20 rabbits apiece. A tie. Mr. Ro a tie. It should have stopped there, but Mr. Romney wasn't satisfied. He said, Noble cheated. He bought in, he brought in rabbits somebody else killed. And so the contest goes on. Those men, those men, they used to be friends. Now they can't be civil with each other. They scowl as they pass on the street. I'm scowling too, but scowling won't bring the rabbits back. They're all skinned and cooked and eaten by now. At least they didn't end up in Romney and Noble's cook pots. They went to families that needed the meat. January 1834. This one's called Losing Levy. Levy Killian moved away. I didn't want her to go. We've been friends since first grade. The farewell party was Thursday night at the Old Rock Schoolhouse. Levy had something to tease each of us about, like Ray sleeping through reading class and Hillary, who on her speed writing test put an even ton of children instead of an even 10. Livy said goodbye to each of us separately. She gave me a picture she'd made of me sitting in front of a piano, wearing my straw hat, an apple halfway to my mouth. I handed Levy the memory book we'd all filled with our different slants. I couldn't get the measles in my throat. I couldn't get the muscles in my throat relaxed enough to tell her how much I'd miss her. Levy. Levy helped clean up her own party, wiping spilled lemonade, gathering sandwich crusts, sweeping cookie crumbs from the floor while the rest of us went home to study for semester reviews. Now Levy's gone west, out of the dust, on her way to California, where the wind takes a rest sometimes. And I'm wondering what kind of friend I am, rest wanting my feet on that road to another place instead of levies. January 1934. This one's called Me and Mad Dog. Arlie Wanderdale, who teaches music once a week at our school, though Ma says he's no teacher at all, just a local singer, just a local song plugger, Arlie Wanderdale asked if I'd like to play a piano solo at the Palace Theater on Wednesday night. I grinned, pleased to be asked, and said, that'd be all right. I don't know if Ma would let me. She's an old mule on the subject of my schooling, she says. You stay home on weeknights, Billy Joe. And mostly, that's what I do. But Arlie Wanderdale said, the management asked me to bring them talent, Billy Joe. And I thought of you. Even before Mad Dog Craddock, I wondered. You and Mad Dog, Arlie Wanderdale said. Darn that blue-eyed boy with his fine face and his smooth voice twice as good as a plowboy has any right to be. I suspected Mad Dog had come first to Arlie Wanderdale's mind, but I didn't get too riled. Not so riled, I couldn't say yes. January 1934. Permission to play. Sometimes when Ma is busy in the kitchen or scrubbing or doing wash, I can ask her something in such a way I annoy her just enough to get an answer, but not so much I get a no. That's a way I found of gaining what I want by catching Ma off guard, especially when I'm after permission to play piano. Right out asking her is no good. She always gets testy about me playing, even though she's the one who truly taught me. Anyway, this time I caught her in the slow stirring of biscuits, her mind on other things, maybe the baby growing inside her. I don't know. But anyhow, she was distracted enough. I was determined enough. This time, I got just what I wanted, permission to play at the palace. On stage. When I point my fingers at the keys, the music springs straight out of me. Right hand playing notes sharp as tongues, telling stories while the smooth, buttery rhythms back me up on the left. Folks sway in the palace aisles, grinning and stomping and out of breath 
and the rest, eyes shining, fingers snapping, feet tapping. It's the best I've ever felt playing hot piano, sizzling with Mad Dog, swinging with the Black Mesa boys, or on my own. Crazy, pestering the keys, that is heaven. How supremely heaven playing piano can be. January 1934. Birthday for FDR. I played so well on Wednesday night, Arlie put his arm across my shoulder and asked me to come and perform at the president's birthday ball. Ma can't say no to this one. It's for President Roosevelt. Not that Mr. Roosevelt will actually be there, but the money collected at the ball, along with the balls all over the country, will go into the president's name to the Warm Springs Foundation, where Mr. Roosevelt stayed once when he was sick. Someday I plan to play for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. Maybe I'll go all the way to the White House in Washington, D.C. In the meantime, it's pretty nice. R. Lee asking me to play twice for Joyce City. January 1934. We'll have to pause there. Tune in next time for a little bit more of Out of the Dust. <laughs>